Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Laurie Smith. It's a one shot piece survivor to another restoration. And it is 6 30 in the morning here in Calgary, Alberta. I'm just waking up having some coffee. It's a Monday morning, September 19th. I'm glad to be here and just glad to be able to continue to do these shows, you know. Um, thanks for, you know, to everybody who's tuned in and listened to my shows. I appreciate your time and uh, taking the time to do that. It's a lot of work keeping up with my stuff. And um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for being here. I appreciate it. And um, we're just looking at a, it's a morning reflection, really, to see where I'm at in my healing journey, what I need to work on, how I'm feeling. Sort of a check-in sort of thing holds me accountable, so I'll do my healing journey. I like to share information that I find helpful. So, you know, it's nice. I hope that... Uh, you know, it's nice to be able to share this stuff with people, and hopefully it's helping you out. If you're a survivor of abuse, you want to make sure that, you know, you're not going to be triggered listening to this show, so you want to be sure you're safe. And so do a safety checklist. Make sure you're safe enough this morning to actually be listening to something like this, that it's not going to trigger you and send you backward in your healing journey, which is very, very important. And, um, you know, nobody wants that, right? I don't, you don't. And so you want to make sure you're safe enough. If you're not sure how to do that, there's lots of websites you can get that information from. I always put one out there because I did the, I actually read it. It's a 60-page chapter in the ASCA Adult Survivors of Child Abuse and War Center program, Survivor to Thriver Workbook. It's like a work, work, it's a manual, Survivor to Thriver Manual, they call it. And you can grab it just free. It's on their website, ASCA. It's Adult Survivors of Child Abuse and War Center program. Just go to their website. You can download that that Survivor to Thriver journal. It's, it's a very lengthy journal or manual, I guess they call it. And uh, the first chapter, 60 pages long, is called Safety First. And um, you can read that and find out how to how to actually, you know, know whether you're safe enough to, to be doing work on your own or whether you should be listening to certain things that might trigger you, right? And then what to do if you are triggered. It's very, very helpful. So get that information and keep yourself safe. If you're not sure, if you're safe enough to be listening, just don't listen to the show. Just turn it off. And um, it wouldn't be hurting my feelings at all. Right? So, um, make sure you're safe enough, and uh, we'll get right into this. We're looking at a, at a an acronym from Cheryl from Havoka. That's H-A-V-O-C-A, Havoka.org, Help for Adult Victims of Child Abuse. And um, she's she's got a acronym for the letters that spell out adult survivors of sexual abuse. But she said in the beginning of it that this would be helpful for anybody who's suffered any type of abuse. It's not just sexual abuse. She just used the letters for these words, so we're on letter V in Survivor, the second V. Uh, voice your pain, let yourself be heard. There's always someone who will listen with an open heart. If you can only whisper, keep trying, no matter how hard it seems, it will get easier. So that's this morning's. Voice your pain, let yourself be heard. There is always someone who will listen with an open heart. If you can only whisper, keep trying, no matter how hard it seems, it will get easier. For survivors of abuse, this is very difficult. I know for myself, you know, I used to tell only certain people certain things about the abuse that I suffered. It was very, very minimal, and I kind of kept it very, um, you know, I never went around telling people that I was abused or about the, what I suffered. I didn't consider myself to necessarily be an abuse survivor. I just, my some of my friends in my teens were abused as well, and so they would be talking about what was going on in their house, and and I'd be talking about kind of what was a little bit about what was going on in my house, what I had suffered, but not much, and um, kept most of it to myself. You know, uh, there was only a couple people that disclosed the child sexual abuse to. That's just because they told me first that they were sexually abused by someone in their family. Believe it or not, it was incest, and um, I don't know why they told me. I guess they just trusted me and thought that I was a trustworthy person to tell. And so then, when they told me that, then I disclosed that I was also. Um, sexually abused by someone in my home so you know I, otherwise I didn't go around just telling people about my pain and my what I had suffered as a child but in as soon as I hit rock bottom 41 and a half you know sitting around um, not doing well not coping well as an adult survivor of child abuse you know I realized that I needed to talk to somebody and I needed to tell somebody and I had told a couple people about the abuse and then they just sort of, um, they used it against me and my, what I had told them sort of as to say that, you know, I was too much and I needed, they didn't want me in their life anymore. And I, so then I was discouraged. I was like, well, okay, that's, maybe it's not a, such a good idea to tell people about what happened to me as a child. And then um, at 41 and a half, I realized I needed help, but I started voicing my pain in a in a blog, actually. Instead of just talking to people, I just started writing a blog and 
talking that way, you know, I voiced my pain that way, and then it became a book, you know, my my book, Life of Death and Redemption, and then uh, and then I started doing blog talk radio and talking on the air, and it was difficult at first. I was very nervous. The shows that I first did, it was very, it was difficult to to tell people about my pain. And now now that it like she said that like she said here, if you can only whisper, keep trying, no matter how hard no, no matter how hard it seems, it will get easier. And that's true. And I suppose that's even like for people that are seeing a counselor or a therapist or whatever. You know, after a while, it just becomes easier to open up about what we've suffered. You know, and especially when you find somebody who's trustworthy. And I have found lots and lots of trustworthy people since I started my healing journey. And so it has gotten a lot easier. And um, so, yeah, I, I, I just say keep reaching out. Like she said here, keep trying. You know, don't yeah, don't shut down. Like just keep trying to find somebody who's trustworthy to listen to you. You don't have to go public like I did. I did this for a reason. But, um, you know, not everybody wants to do this sort of thing, to go public with their story. I did it for a reason. There was a lot of reasons, actually. Um but one main reason, but there was several other reasons as well. So it's it, for me, it was I feel comfortable doing that. But not everybody would, and so you have to make sure that you're, you know, that you're safe enough. Uh, is sort of keep your information carefully. You know, don't just I guess uh, be careful who you share it with is what I would say, because you know there there are people out there that would take advantage of that. So make sure that the person that you're going to tell is is trustworthy. And, you know, what I did is I, when I first started my healing journey, I joined an anonymous group, uh, Survivors of Child Abuse Anonymous Group. And I found that very helpful <laughs> because nobody know, knew anybody's real names. And, um, you know, I was able to talk to people who had been through the same things that I'd been through or similar. And then it was very helpful because it was validation for me. And um, nobody knew my real name. They didn't know it was me. And then I didn't know who they were. It was just anonymous. I really liked that. So, you know, whatever you got to do, you know, you make sure that, that you get help, right? Very important. So I like that one. That's good. And we'll move on to this one section called, this is the inner child healing work, really, from Havoka as well, H-A-V-O-C-A, Havoka.org, Help for Adult Victims of Child Abuse. And this is Loving the Wounded Child. This is looking at their inner child healing tab. And so if you go to their website, you just go to the top and click on Survivors tab. It'll bring you to a web page. Their page has all their information on the left-hand side. You can click on the link that says... Uh, or the tab that says inner child. And it'll take you to their inner child pages, and that's what we're looking at here. This morning we're going to pick up, well, Friday we were looking at this one thing about being a passive victim, you know. It says the only way we can be whole is to own all all of the parts of ourselves. By owning all the parts, we can then have choices about how we respond to life. And by denying, hiding, and suppressing parts of ourselves, we doom ourselves to live life in reaction. So what she says here, I'm not sure who wrote this, but I wonder if it's Cheryl. And, um, but it is Havoka, right? So it might be Cheryl from Havoka. A technique, she says, I have found very valuable in this healing process is to relate to the different wounded parts of ourself as different ages of the inner child. So these different ages of the child may be literally tied to an event that happened at that age. For example, when I was seven, I tried to commit suicide, or the age of the child might be a symbolic designator for a pattern of abuse, deprivation that occurred throughout our childhood. For example, the nine-year-old with envy feels completely emotionally isolated and desperately needy, lonely, a condition which was true for most of my childhood and not tied to any specific incident that I know of that happened when I was nine. So she's just talking about her own story and sort of these inner children within her, you know, that could be tied to a specific event or could be just something more, um, not any specific event, but just the general feeling, right? So uh, these inner children, I know when I started doing my, my inner child work, inner child healing work, I really didn't really kind of think I was, that I needed that because I, I didn't see myself as somebody who had these inner children within. I just knew that I was wounded. But as I started doing the work, I started to realize there was many, several inner children that needed some help, you know. And it was interesting how when I'm working through it all, it's it has been very, very helpful for me. But you, like I'm saying, you have to be very careful if you're going to do this work on your own. Um, I was able to do this work on my own pretty well, pretty much. Um, it, I did have some help with it. And so I wasn't completely on my own. So I could do parts of it on my own, but the other parts I did have some help with, especially with the child sexual abuse. So what I would say is, you know, if you're not sure you're safe enough to be doing a, starting something like looking at inner child healing work and actually going through the process of doing it, then you're just thinking, oh, boy, I don't know, you know, if I'm strong enough to do that or if it's going to just 
cause me to have a lot of, you know, flashbacks or PTSD sort of events come up or, you know, that the trauma is going to be too much, then you, if you have any doubts at all, <clears throat> don't do it at all by yourself. Make sure you have someone, you know, even if it's like whatever, if you have a counselor or a therapist or, you know, someone who you really, really, really trust <laughs> and make sure they are trustworthy um, to help you do that. Because it is very, it's it's actually uh, hard to do and to get in touch with these wounded parts of ourselves from so long ago. And it brings back a lot of feelings and a lot of really painful stuff. That's the only reason I was able to heal, is because I was able to start facing the pain <laughs> instead of running from it and hiding it and masking it and covering it up with everything you can imagine, whether it was food, you know, cigarettes, drugs. You know, when I was younger, I just used drugs to mask the pain. And then when I got older and got off the drugs at the age of 22, right around 22 years old, and then... Um, I didn't really wasn't into alcohol, but then I used, just was running all the time, and staying very very busy, and staying very much isolated, and so this way I didn't have to. I sort of was able to um, hide from all of my pain. You know, it would just it would rear its ugly head every now and then, and that's when I would have a lot of suicidal ideation and um, self injury type stuff going on. But you know, it's it's horrific what we've suffered and. You know, you make sure that you're safe enough before you start something like this. That's what I always tell people because it was a lot of work to do this, and I took me. It's I'm still working on it, and it's taken me many years. I started this inner child healing work. I would say pretty much like 2010. It's now 2016. It's going to be 2017. You know, we're looking at seven years of of, of, of inner child healing work, which the bulk of it I did probably oh 2011, 2012, where I really started making progress in it. So. Um, you know, it's been a few years, but it took me quite a while to do it. And it is, it's a big job and that took me a lot of work. And so I wouldn't suggest, you know, unless you're absolutely sure, don't, don't try something like this on your own. Really, it's just not worth it. So we'll, we'll pick up the rest of this article, um, tomorrow morning. So, uh, positive reinforcement or, you know, what, am, what can I do to help myself? What am I doing right in my daily walk? You know, looking at positives instead of the progress, instead of negative thoughts, right? And I think that's important because, you know, as survivors of abuse, right, it's so easy to to just become really um, too critical or too hard on ourselves, you know, just saying, well, I I should be this, I shouldn't be in this position right now. I should be much further along in my healing journey or, you know, I should be feeling differently or this or that. And we can always be really hard on ourselves. And it's like, it's really easy to get down on ourselves then and then we start feeling like that whatever our poor wounded self felt when we were younger if we if we if, if you know if if we survived a lot of emotional psychological you know verbal abuse from somebody then we just start getting all this negative thoughts around us again and that's not good and listening to that inner critical parent voice that's telling us that we're not doing it right and we're not doing what we should be doing i thought we should just look at our positives you know and acknowledge what we do what we've done and and take a look at that because that's very important to do you know i mean we, you know we can only move one day at a time, right? The things that we do can only happen one day at a time. And, and over the course of time, if we just check into the check in and see what positive stuff has been going on, you know, it starts to add up, and we start to realize, like, wow, I, I have made progress. You know, I am doing good. It's very important to do that, right? So I think, you know, what am I doing right in my daily walk? Well, just you know, continuing on my healing journey is very important. Um, you know getting help, right? I'm still reaching out, getting help. I belong to a survivor support group as well that I that I do belong to outside of this, right? It's an it's a it's anonymous. And so, you know, um it's very very helpful. And so that I think is is a really it's a move in the right direction. Um as well as you know, just uh, continuing on to look at what's helpful, what I can do to help myself. These are positives, right, in our life. Um, positive affirmation, I can say today, I'm a friendly person. That's the next one up. I'm a friendly person. Um, Friday's was I am joyful. I really like that. This morning's is I am a friendly person. I can walk around saying that all day. I'm a friendly person. But if I'm not friendly, then it's really not going to help. Um, I'm a very, I'm a friendly person. I have walls sort of built up around myself, you know, still. I'm sure of it. And um, I'm not, I, I don't just let anybody into my life. Even though I do, do talk publicly about my stuff. I'm very isolated. Um, I live in a big, big city, but nobody knows who I am. Um, and I don't have any local, very mi- well. I have a couple of local friends, but I don't. But they're not. I wouldn't consider them to be really good friends. They're just mainly acquaintances. 
if I needed something severely, I guess I could call them. They might be able, they might try to help me out. Um, but otherwise, we don't hang out. You know, I don't have any close friends close by. But that's probably because my husband's terminally ill, which takes a lot of my time, and I work full time. And also, I'm working on a bachelor degree at the same time. <laughs> so I'm trying to do all of this stuff in a 12-hour period. You know, and I got well, 24-hour period, and I, and I got to sleep. You know, at some point. So I do try to get a few hours of sleep. I don't sleep well because of the abuse, right? I've never slept well because. When I was growing up, the, our home was just so horrific. All night long, it was horrific. And then all day, I have to go to school and I'd be abused most of the day when I got home from school. And then, um, you know, at nighttime, it just all started again. So I, I've never really slept all that well. And even as an adult, I don't. And um, and also just my health issues, right? It's a horrible situation. So I don't have a lot of time to go look for friends, right? Or to be friendly to somebody. Which is a shame because I actually am a very friendly person. <laughs> I talk to people in elevators. Uh, I'm one of these people that... Some people find me annoying because I'm actually really friendly. And some people think, oh, God, you know, who's this woman talking to me? You know, and then other people are are um, accepting of it. And they're just like, wow, oh. because really, well, I'll talk to anybody and everybody. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a very friendly person, but I don't let so many people into my life. See, just because I'm friendly to people, because I like people to be friendly to me, um, doesn't mean that I'm going to let that person get that close to me. I, I let very few Few people get very close to me, so I'm a friendly person. But unfortunately, I don't do what do relationships well, and so I'm working on that. I'm working on my own issues and my own problems with relationship type stuff. Still working on it. Um, but I'd say, yeah, I'm a friendly person, and I like to be friendly. I like to be cheerful with people when I talk to them, because I know that people are not necessarily having a good day. You know, they might be having a horrible, rotten day. <laughs> Any number of things could be going on in their life, you know, divorce, sickness, illness, you know, bankruptcy stuff possibly looming over their heads. Maybe their children are involved in drugs and criminal activity. I mean, who knows what's going on in people's lives. So, I mean, I try to be a sort of a, a source of sunshine for people. And so when I talk to people, I try to be upbeat and very friendly. And that's just how I am because I, I might be the only person they talk to that day that tells them to have a good day. You know, so I'm not always thinking about myself, and I think that helps me to be a friendly person. Um, I do think about myself too, but I also think of others, and I try to think of others anyway. So I would say I'm a friendly person. I could say that, I guess. Um, I could work on it, though. I guess we all could, right? Self care. What are we doing to physically, you know, spiritually, emotionally care for ourselves? What do we need to work on? Um, I'm working on the physical stuff really seriously. I don't know. My body's just so racked. It's just screwed. Like, I mean, I look okay. If you were to look at me, you know, a picture of me, you think I'd, oh, it looks all right. But internally, I'm not doing all that well. Um, I have a lot of problems with my breathing. I have a lot of problems with my lungs. And I smoke, you know. I've been smoking since I was like 12 years old. I mean, it's not cigarettes, but other things. And I started smoking cigarettes when I was 19. And it's my habitual addiction. And, you know, as a, as a survivor of abuse with an addictive personality, it's a real problem. I was a, I was a drug user from the age of 12 to 21, 22 years old. So almost 10 years of drug use, heavy drug use. We're talking not... Not just mild, you know, partying and stuff like that. I, I was a drug user. So, you know, I didn't take care of myself. and I was abused physically, you know, in every way, sexually, as a child. So my body is kind of screwed. <laughs> and so I don't know, even if I do try to take my care of myself physically now, the outcomes are probably not going to be what I would like them to be because of my age. I'm, I'm hitting 51 here pretty quick. And so, you know, I'm kind of not looking for to be in the best shape, you know, that like somebody else can be in that, that good a shape at this point. But I'd like to at least try to help myself out, and I think that's a smart thing to do. You know, so I'm working on getting more exercise, cutting down on cigarettes, and getting more rest, getting more sleep, you know, in the process of, of trying to work that all into my daily schedule of working full-time, taking care of my husband who's terminally ill, <laughs> as well as... Um, as uh, now we have to pack and move, which is a lot of work because we have lived in this suite. We've lived in this suite ten years, and it's going to be a lot of work to go through and clean things up and get rid of stuff. Ten years worth of stuff, so it's it's like his and mine, you know, just you know, just loaded down. So I got to clean, I got to pack. So in the meantime, you know, all this stuff, of course, like this is how our lives go, right? So it's like, what can I do to help myself out? And I thought, well, even if I just row for ten minutes a day and then cut down on the smokes just a couple of smokes a day. 
that's a start. We have to start somewhere, right? So I'm very much optimistic about about little things because <laughs> I'm like, hey, it's got to be the little things that kind of work. So that's what I'm doing for physical stuff. As far as spirituality, my spirituality is in you know it's in top shape. You know, I'm I'm very well doing well in my spiritual my spiritual um, well being, right? My emotional well being. Well being. I'm still working on a little bit of that. I have hard days too. You know, I mean, I do. I have flashbacks. Like last night, I had some flashbacks and just the uh, Memories, you know, abuse memories, especially of the physical abuse, you know, sort of haunts me a little bit. But, I mean, it's just, the, and then with that comes the emotional pain that my wounded inner children. So that's, I need to, that's a, that's a cue for me that I need to go in and do some inner child healing work, which means that I need to go inside. And I haven't had really, I haven't made the time. I shouldn't say I haven't had the time. I haven't made the time to go do that. So, because it takes a little bit of time to go in and meditate and get in there and, and do that work. And so... You know, I need to make time for that. So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna be emotionally well, I need to work on it, right? And so I got to put more time in somewhere in there. So something else has got to go. <laughs> so you know, maybe I just can't study as much as I need to. You know, I'm working on a bachelor, a bachelor of ministry, and I need to. I'd like to finish it up within a year. I've already been working on it four years, and it's a lot of work. And I need to get. I'm trying to study and get things done, and something's gonna have to go so I can take a half an hour and do my inner child healing work and do my, you know, and then I take another half an hour and do my rowing, right? I don't have to be, i got to work that stuff in. So this is where, that's why this show is helpful. That's why I'm doing this, right? And hopefully it'll help you to sort of see, like, what, what we could do, you know, because we can talk it through or work it through in our minds. Like, wow, I guess I could do this if I just sort of squeeze this in here and maybe give up 10 minutes of that or, 10, you know, 15 minutes of reading time or 20 minutes of TV time or whatever we do that takes our time up, right? Because most people are busy. And so that's just the way it is, right? Havoka's got a uh, really awesome Survivor Bill of Survivors Bill of Rights, and this is sort of winding up on their Survivors Bill of Rights. But this is specific to the domain of psychotherapy. You have the right to be taught skills that lessen risk of trauma, a containment, reliable temporal spatial boundaries for recovery work, b systematic relaxation. So, so they said we have the right to, as survivors of abuse, we have the right to be taught skills that lessen risk of trauma. And that's containment and system, systematic relaxation. So that's awesome. We have rights, and we just need to know that we do have those rights. So if you're seeing a therapist or counselor or somebody, you know, you have the right to to be taught skills that lessen risk of trauma. So that's like the, the boundary work, you know, the, the the relaxation work, right, the containment and the relaxation. That's awesome. And personal bill of rights as far as um, the, Charles H. Whitfield goes, he's got a... Healing the Child Within, Charles H. Whitfield, M.D. He's got a personal bill of rights, too. And we're on number 33. He's only got 38 of these, but these were pretty cool. And um, you can find this anywhere. It's free. It's out there. 33, I can take care of myself no matter no matter what. That's awesome. 33, I can take care of myself no matter what. I really like that because, um, you know, that doesn't mean that I can do it all on my own without any help. You know what I mean? But I can take care of myself no matter what which means that I can be responsible for, for what I need to get done, you know. And that's always a big issue for me because I, I even did talked about this uh, last week sometime, that, you know, i got to move and all this stuff, and I'm like, God, you know, can I actually can I get it done? Because part of me, you know, part of that wounded inner child stuff that still hangs around is that critical voice that tells me I'll never make it, I can't do it, you know, I'm kind of worthless, useless, should have died when I was a baby, and all this stuff, you know, because that rolls around in my head because that, that's what my mother used to tell me all the time. And so... You know, she was horrifically abusive towards me. So, you know, I can take care of myself no matter what. And, I mean, this just resonates with me because, I've, you know, like a lot of other people, I've really had a tough go of it. And, you know, I've had lots of help on the way, I mean, along the way, you know what I mean? Um, there's been lots of people that have helped me out in my lifetime, thank God, to get where I am today. I'm very thankful for it. And um, But I've also had to do a lot of it on my own. And so the stuff that I've done on my own just proves that I can do it. And, I mean, I've, I've held jobs for like 10 years. I've held jobs for six, seven years. You know, some people look at my resume and say, well, geez, you know, you've changed jobs a lot. And I'd be like, well, how many jobs have you held for 10 years or seven years? You know, I've held multiple jobs for that long. One job for 10 years, one job for six years, one job for five years, and another job for five years actually seven years, seven years with the same company. So in my adult life, like I tend to hold jobs for a long, long time. I can look after myself. I can take good care of myself. And I don't, you know, I mean, I can be, 
I don't want to say proud. I hate the word. I don't really like the word proud or pride. It just kind of bothers me. But I can be, um, I can feel good about the fact that I do know how to take care of myself. And I can take care of things that need to be done, um, especially if I put my mind to it, no matter what. So, because as a, as a survivor of abuse, just for us to get where we've gotten today, really, you know, it's 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 it takes amazing strength to get where we are today. You know what I mean? That's why I mean, you know, I, it's not that I sit there and say, oh well, you know, walk in my shoes. I mean, I've, I've said it many, many, many times, but it's like just to get where we are today, it's taken an incredible amount of work. So that's what I'm saying. We can take care of ourselves. I can take care of myself no matter what. So I really like that. That's awesome. What else we want to look at here? We have, uh, oh yeah, I want to look at this uh, containment boundaries thing from, um, this is Michael C. Irving. He's a PhD sculptor, coach, counselor. He's a survivor of abuse, Michael C. Irving. He's got his own website, Irving Studios. You can type it in or just type in Child Abuse Survivor Monument. And he's got this section called uh, Abuse Destroys Boundaries. It's boundary, looking at boundaries, containment and boundaries. So, you know, he's talking about during child abuse, we, we already looked at this part, during child abuse, boundaries are totally ignored, violated, shattered. Uh, to, sur- to survive abuse, you had to dissociate from any sense of boundary. Um, as the deadening response to abuse became habitual, you missed out on developing the inner sense of boundaries. Yeah, because boundaries were crossed, or there just were no boundaries, right? So what they are talking about here, um, we've already looked at identifying boundaries. What are boundaries, right? To have good boundaries, you have to identify them and think about what they are. Physical distance. Physical distance refers to the space that you have around yourself and others. For example, being too close or too far away. Emotions. Having difficulty with emotional boundaries means not being able to distinguish between your feelings and others' feelings or merging with someone else, someone's emotional energy. Right? Time. is here's, here's one we're picking up here. This is uh, the boundary of time. Problems with boundaries over time means not distinguishing between present, past, and future. It is feeling yesterday's traumas as occurring in the here and now, or being absorbed in the dread or fear that something terrible is going to occur. These are probably my biggest issue. Uh, Problems with boundaries over time means not distinguishing between present, past, and future. It's feeling yesterday's traumas as occurring in the here and now, or being absorbed in the dread or fear that something terrible is going to occur. I kind of have that issue going on. Uh, space issues with space means not knowing that the place you were in is not somewhere else. You, for for example, your home feels like the place where you were abused. Now that I don't have a problem with. Um, see, so certain things we might be able to relate to, and others others we don't have a problem with, right? But it's just interesting to see what these are. And um, so space issues with space means not knowing that the place you were in is not somewhere else. For example. Your home feels like the place where you were abused, right? So your place now, like in my place in Canada, you know, if I had space boundaries issues, then, you know, I might be feeling that that, that this is the place or I'm back at the place I was where I was abused. I don't have a, the ability to keep them separate. Um, that I don't have problems with. And thought boundaries. Thoughts, having, having what others think dramatically affect you is an example of not having healthy boundaries between you and them. So, yeah, this is a real problem for a lot of people because I've met many, many people over the years who have these issues. Um, thoughts, having what others think dramatically affect you is an example of not having healthy boundaries between you and them. I've had some problems with that, but not in my adult life. But as a, I mean, obviously growing up in an abusive home, what my mother thought of me and what my family thought of me was very important to me. And so, you know, that was a problem. But not as an adult. I really Now as an adult, I don't have issues with that so much, you know. But I know when I was younger, younger I did for sure. And um, so these are really good to look at. So you can grab that information. Just go to irvingstudios.com or go to, um, ch- just type into your browser, Irving Studios or or Child Abuse Survivor Monument. Um, that'll come up. And you can grab that information. It's under the, it's under the self-care tab for survivors of abuse. And then it's called Containment and Boundaries. So we have about a minute left. And so just what I would say, be good to yourself today, you know. Do something good for yourself, you know. And... Reach out and get help. Like if you're struggling, like I always say, on every on every show that I ever do, um, you know, don't suffer on your own. Reach out and get help if if you feel like you can't cope and you're having a hard day, you're having a hard time, you know, or a week from now, you remember listening to my show or listening to me talking here, and you know you're having a hard time. Just keep this in the back of your mind. Reach out and get some help. You know, don't suffer on your own because that's what I did, and it, it nearly destroyed me. I'm telling you, you reach out and get some help. There are there are good people out there, but you have to keep looking and you have to keep searching for them, right? 
And so have a wonderful day, everybody, and we'll talk to you tomorrow.